In sports, determined athletes train and pain their bodies, forsaking the comforts of life for athletic prowess. They strive for goals that many people couldn't dream of. Sadly, calamity strikes the hardest in triumphant moments. These athletes died while playing the sports they loved. Dale Earnhardt Sr. was on the final lap of the Daytona 500 when he fatally crashed in 2001. Over the course of his career, the 49-year-old husband and father of four had won 76 races, seven Winston Cup championships, and widespread adoration. Dale Earnhardt was a man of extremes. Friend, foe. Every man, Superman. And he was a hero lost too soon. In his final race, Earnhardt helped his son Dale Jr. finish in second place. He blocked an advancing vehicle to ensure that Jr. and his other teammate Michael Waltrip clinched the top two spots. But the blocked car made contact, causing Earnhardt's vehicle to veer into a wall. Then another out-of-control car careened into Earnhardt's. Dale Jr. witnessed his father's fatal accident in his rearview mirror mere moments before he crossed the finish line. Senior lost consciousness and never woke up, pronounced dead at the hospital. Volleyball fans worshipped Flo Hyman. Imposingly tall and strong, she would have thrived on any team. Her impact on American volleyball made her an icon. Before she came along in 1974, the U.S. women's team was in tatters. They tanked at the 1964 and 1968 Olympics and didn't even qualify in 1972. With Hyman's help, the U.S. took fifth place in the 1978 World Championships and seemed like shoe wins for gold in the 1980 Olympics in Moscow. It didn't end up happening when America boycotted those games due to Cold War tensions with the Soviet Union. But four years later in Los Angeles, Hyman led the women's team to a silver despite being the oldest player on the roster. As you grow older, it's something that you have to deal with and face and come to terms with. It wasn't an easy thing. I think in some ways volleyball helped me a lot. In January 1986, Hyman was 31 and still going strong. She joined a Japanese team in an elite league and dominated. But during a game in Tokyo, she subbed out, sat down, and slid silently to the floor. Up to that point, she had looked and played well. Not a single doctor had spotted a problem throughout her career. But an autopsy revealed that she had Marfan syndrome, a hard-to-diagnose illness that damages the aorta. It turned out that her heart had a dime-sized defect that caused her aorta to rupture. When asked to comment on the passing of 26-year-old Fran Crippen, Coach Bill Rose told the LA Times, I don't know of a swimmer that is any more popular with his fellow athletes. Crippen had a reputation for perseverance. When he fell short of his dream of swimming in the 2008 Olympics, he picked himself up and kept competing. His persistence paid off countless times in his life. He was an 11-time All-American and two-time ACC Swimmer of the Year for the University of Virginia. But in October 2010, his never-quit attitude may have killed him. At the FINA Open Water 10km World Cup in Dubai, he raced in nearly 90-degree water on a 100-degree day. Multiple swimmers suffered heat exhaustion and had to be hospitalized. Toward the final stretch of the event, Crippen informed his coach he wasn't feeling well, but he pushed himself to continue. He never reached the end, drowning probably due to heat exhaustion. When Jose Flores took up horse racing, he was following in his father's footsteps. The son of a Peruvian jockey, Flores watched races as a boy and resolved to win them as a man. After settling in Pennsylvania, he started a stellar run, winning his first title in 1992. Over the course of his 30-plus year career, he became one of the winningest jockeys in the state's history, with 4,650 victories and over $64 million in earnings. In March 2018, the 56-year-old Flores was closing in on win number 4,651 when something went horribly awry. He and his horse were leading when the steed suddenly fell. Flores slammed head first against the ground. He left behind a wife, their 7-year-old son, and two older sons from an earlier relationship. During the early 1980s, Soviet fencer Vladimir Smirnov was arguably the best in the world. In 1980, he earned gold at the Moscow Olympics by breaking a three-way tie in the men's individual foil. He also earned silver and bronze medals in team competition. The following year, he pulled off an impressive comeback win at the World Fencing Championships after seeing his teammates eliminated in the preliminaries. In 1982, he sought to extend his dominance at the Rome World Championships. Instead, his reign reached a gruesome end. Smirnov squared off with German Matthias Baer. During their fateful match, Bear's blade broke against Smirnov's chest. The blade pierced Smirnov's mask, went into his head, and punctured his brain. Though placed on life support, doctors said he had no brain reflexes. Smirnov was 29. The horrifying incident ushered in a new era of safety precautions for fencers. 
These athletes lost all their money, sometimes going broke as soon as they left their sport. Debbie Thomas, a bronze medalist at the 1988 Olympics, was an African-American trailblazer and one of the most popular figure skaters in America. After retiring from skating, Thomas graduated from medical school and began practicing orthopedic surgery. Her attitude caused problems. She bounced from job to job. She tried starting her own practice, but it failed. According to the TV series Fix My Life, on which she appeared in 2015, she lived in a bed-bug-infested trailer with her fiancé. Her medical license lapsed, and her only income came from selling gold bullion. In 2012, she approached a police officer, saying she had a gun and that she planned on hurting herself. This led to a bipolar diagnosis, which she denies. Thomas told The Washington Post, I'm very misunderstood because I look at the world differently. You can call it the Olympian mentality. Behind the facade of a hoops prodigy, Kenny Anderson hid a more complicated life. As he told SB Nation in 2013, he was molested by two different men and spent his childhood in the shadow of his mother's addictions. His NBA earnings totaled more than $63 million, but his demons remained. His lifestyle, which included numerous mansions, 11 cars, and eight children by three different mothers, took a toll on his wallet. He filed for bankruptcy in 2005, the year he left the NBA. As he explained to Forbes, I wasn't a gambler or a drug addict, but I did foolish things. In the 2017 documentary Mr. Chibs, Anderson showed what it meant to lose so much. Anderson says he lives comfortably now, and his main focus is being a better parent to his many children. I had everything. Mm -hmm. Millions. Mm. And I was like, miserable. Vince Young's college football coach told Sports Illustrated his former star quarterback was obviously one of the best to ever play college football. Many fans consider Young's 2006 Rose Bowl performance one of the best. It bought him a ticket to the NFL, but despite winning Offensive Rookie of the Year and earning two Pro Bowl appearances, Young struggled. After clashes with his coaches, he played his last NFL game in 2011. A suicide scare and a DUI turned him into tabloid fodder, and a lifetime of ignoring his finances led to bankruptcy that same year. He was far too generous, notoriously spending $15,000 for one meal at a cheesecake factory. In recent years, Young has righted his financial ship and took a job at his alma mater, the University of Texas. He played for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders of the CFL in 2017 before an injury forced him to retire, most likely for good this time. Arancha Sanchez Vicario won 14 tennis grand slams and became only the second woman ever to be ranked number one simultaneously in both singles and doubles. Despite earning $17 million in prize money over her 17-year career and another $40 million in endorsements, the icon told Spanish magazine La Otra Conica, My parents left me with nothing, and now I'm indebted to the tax authorities and I will not be quiet. Sanchez Vicario sued her father and her brother for restitution. According to her lawsuit, her family was living extravagantly, thanks to offshore accounts and duplicitous dealings, while she got by on 1,500 euros per month. Crowned World Council Heavyweight Champion in 1986, Mike Tyson went on to win the World Boxing Association and International Boxing Federation Championships. He ruled the ring into 1989, but things started to fall apart. His wife, Robin Givens, divorced him, alleging physical abuse. In early 1990, he lost the championship to an underdog. In 1991, he was accused of rape, and in 1992, he was sentenced to six years for the crime. When he got out of jail after only three years, Tyson returned to boxing. During a match with Evander Holyfield, Tyson was disqualified for biting off part of Holyfield's ear. The boxing commission withheld $3 million from his purse. He lost another big fight in 2002 and filed for bankruptcy in 2003. He wasn't earning enough to support his $400,000 a month lifestyle, and his debts totaled more than $20 million. He was probably regretting the $173,000 diamond chains. I never really learned the art of handling money as a kid, you know, that's an art. Hall of Famer Dennis Rodman spent millions of dollars not on diamond chains but on NBA fines. In 1997, he was fined $25,000 for kicking a cameraman. An 11-game suspension for the incident cost him around $1 million. Later that year, he was fined $50,000 for expletive-laced comments he made about Mormons while he was in Utah. In 2000, he raked up $13,500 in fines in five games. Fines weren't the only things sucking the cash out of Rodman's personal 
personal fortune. Rodman's lifestyle cost him around $31,000 a month, and he wasn't taking home enough money to pay for it. In 2012, CBS reported he owed $860,000 in child support payments and owed about $350,000 in California state taxes. According to CNBC, before his infamous murder trial, O.J. Simpson was worth an estimated $11 million. The trial cost him around $50,000 a day, yet he continued to generate income while he was in custody, mostly through the sale of memorabilia, which actually increased in demand. O.J. Simpson autographs were even more valuable if they were dated from the time of the trial. Even so, during the civil trial that followed his acquittal, his attorneys claimed he was $850,000 in debt. As of 2014, the Goldman and Brown families say they've been able to collect less than 1% of the $33.5 million they were awarded in that case. Simpson has a pension from the NFL worth $25,000 a month, and by law, the Goldmans and Browns can't take any of it. So he may have lost millions, but he isn't exactly destitute. Dorothy Hamill was just 19 when she won figure skating gold at the 1976 Winter Olympics. It was tough for a teenager to suddenly be smart about managing millions of dollars from endorsements. Hamill filed for bankruptcy in 1996, claiming $1.3 million in assets and $1.6 million in debt, with no contracts to perform, to endorse products, to commentate, or to perform other professional services. She could no longer self-market her way out of her financial woes. It just wasn't everything I thought winning an Olympic gold medal would be. Hamill blamed her estranged husband for talking her into bad business ventures, although her friends told the press that she had pretty terrible spending habits. As of 2018, Hamill says she's changed her ways. She said, The good news is I finally found people that are trustworthy and I'm a little smarter. Golfer John Daly made a name for himself on the PGA Tour in 1991 when he won the PGA Championship playing as an alternate. His performance earned him the coveted title of Rookie of the Year. Daly squandered the money he earned as a professional golfer in one of the most devastating ways possible. He gambled it all away in casinos over about 15 years. In a 2014 interview with TMZ Sports, Daly says he calculated his total gambling losses at around $90 million. Daly told TMZ that he would often and take out million-dollar markers and play blackjack. Sometimes he'd have as much as $600,000 on a single table. When asked if he regretted his gambling days, he just said, Man, I had a great time. In 1985, at the age of 17, Boris Becker became the youngest men's singles champion at Wimbledon. By 1996, he had three Wimbledon wins, plus a U.S. Open win and two Australian Open wins. The New York Post says he was worth about $63 million in prize money and sponsorships. Becker lost a large portion of his fortune after a brief romantic encounter with a Russian model named Angela Armakova. She got pregnant, which was particularly awkward since the hookup happened while his wife was also pregnant. The subsequent divorce and child support for his various children has estimated to cost him over $26 million. The German government later came after him for millions in back taxes. Finally, in 2017, after decades of financial woe, Becker was declared bankrupt. Deuce McAllister got into the University of Mississippi on his own merits and made a name for himself in football. He went on to a career in the NFL, where he played for nine seasons and was voted into the Pro Bowl in 2003. He became legendary while playing for the New Orleans Saints, setting their all-time rushing touchdown record in 2008. According to Pro Football Talk, McAllister made tens of millions during his career, but then he made an unfortunate decision to buy a Jackson, Mississippi Nissan dealership, which went bankrupt in 2009 after Nissan says he defaulted on his payments and went over his credit line. By 2011, Whitney National Bank was after McAllister for an unpaid $1.8 million mortgage. Former NFL quarterback Mark Brunel was once worth about $50 million, but he squandered it all on nine shaky business enterprises. According to SB Nation, five of those nine businesses went under, and as of 2011, Brunel was the subject of six lawsuits. The worst of all his investments was real estate firm Champion LLC, which lost him a ton of money when the market crashed. SB Nation said he was so broke that he planned to get a job as a medical sales representative upon his retirement, but in 2018, he landed a job as a local TV sports anchor. He also works as a high school football coach for the Episcopal Eagles, which is a gig he says he loves. He told 1010XL, Honestly, when I took the job, I thought I may do it for two or three years. And now I'm going into year six, and I have no plans of leaving anytime soon. All-Pro Lawrence Taylor was a Hall of Fame nominee who played linebacker in the NFL for 13 seasons and earned about $50 million over the course of his career. A lot of that money went toward a drug and alcohol problem.
I went on the bench for like a, over a year, a, every day for over a year. At its worst, Taylor says his drug habit cost him thousands of dollars a day. In 1988, he was suspended for failing the NFL's drug test, and he was later arrested for buying crack cocaine from an undercover officer. Taylor also once owned a $10 million business that went bust, and in 1990, he filed a false tax return that came back to bite him. In 1998, he filed for bankruptcy protection to avoid foreclosure on his $600,000 home in New Jersey. In 2010, he was arrested on charges of having sex with a minor. He pleaded guilty and got probation. Former quarterback Michael Vick became infamous back in 2007 when he pleaded guilty to charges related to an illegal dogfighting ring. Vick co-owned Bad News Kennels, which was training around 50 pit bull terriers to participate in high-stakes dogfights. They executed the dogs that didn't perform well. Vick spent 18 months in prison and accumulated $17.8 million in debt. In 2008, he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Since then, he's tried to redeem himself. In 2014, he told ESPN he filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy instead of Chapter 7 so he would have an opportunity to pay back his debts. He said, I didn't want to stiff people who never stiffed me. Sports fans are used to their idols being out of sight and mythic, basically even gods. That usually means they are someone you look up to and admire, but sometimes the person you thought was Zeus is much more like Hades. Barry Bonds is probably most remembered for all the steroids and for being a jerk to everyone. During the baseball slugger's career, he was openly hostile toward the media, and he treated his fans with contempt. Once, a fan told him he'd been trying to get his autograph for four years, to which Bonds replied, I want you to keep your streak active. Another time, a 12-year-old fan handed him a card to sign, and he ripped it in two. But as Bonds would have us believe now, that was all just an act. In 2016, he issued a heartfelt apology for his past behavior, saying, Me. It's on me. I'm to blame for the way I was portrayed because I was a dumbass. I was straight stupid, and I'll be the first to admit it. I'm not going to try to justify the way I acted toward people. When viewed cynically, it's not hard to connect the dots here. A heartfelt apology equals fans not hating you as much, which equals maybe getting elected to the Hall of Fame. But as of 2019, Bonds still hasn't received enough votes for Hall of Fame glory. Barry, this is one of our radio announcers. Uh, Joe Buck, you know, Jack Buck, this is his kid. And Barry's like, so? With a net worth of $45 million, Cam Newton probably doesn't depend on income from autograph sales to keep bread on the table. According to Pro Football Talk, in 2012, Newton appeared in a North Carolina mall and charged fans $125 to sign photographs. The price went up to $150 for a football and $175 for a jersey. And if you wanted a personal message, that was another $50. Basically, that meant a lot of fans were priced out of an autograph of any kind. At that point in Newton's career, people were not too bothered by the move, and a lot of fans even defended him. After all, a lot of people are just planning on turning around and selling those autographed items on eBay anyway. But then in 2019, he got into an altercation with some opposition fans and asked a security guard to bring him a dustpan that one kid was holding, which he promptly threw in the trash. Newton has taken some heat for other bad behavior too, like making sexist jabs at female reporters, turning up the music in the locker room so reporters can't interview view other players, and just generally being a sore loser. Jose Canseco was not only an unapologetic steroid user, he actually advocated for them. In his memoir, he claimed that steroids can make people stronger, sexier, and improve overall quality of life. Steroid use can be seen as a big fat middle finger to the fans. It's like saying the integrity of the game doesn't matter as long as it all ends in a win. But that's not the only thing Canseco did to his fans. He threatened and hurled profanities at them, and he also charged kids for autographs, although sometimes he sent his twin brother to pretend to be him at signings in other places. According to the New York Times, Canseco once threatened to bash in the head of a fan whom he incorrectly thought was making racial comments. During another incident, he pointed to a heckling fan and challenged him to a fight. And his 2013 Reddit Ask Me Anything is full of all all kinds of stories about general nastiness, including rude behavior at restaurants, snubbing kids seeking autographs, and threatening to shoot his neighbor's dog. You'd think that someone named Meta World Peace would be into keeping the peace, but there was a time when he had one of the most pugnacious reputations in the NBA. In November 2004, Peace, who was then still going by his birth name Ron Artest, was one of the primary instigators of the infamous Malice at the Palace. He was playing for the Indiana Pacers at the time in an away game against the Detroit Pistons. The brawl began when a fan threw a cup at him, which prompted him to lose his composure, run into the stands, and tackle the fan who he thought had thrown the cup. Nearby 
spectators tried to restrain him, and another player, Steven Jackson, who had followed our test into the stands, threw a punch at another fan. Soon, several more players were in the stands, fans were throwing bottles and punches, and the Pacers had to make a quick exit before outraged fans overwhelmed them. Nine players were suspended for their behavior during the brawl, with our test suspended for the rest of the season. Since then, he's calmed down a bit. Considering that his name change happened after the incident, maybe his desire for world peace didn't happen until after the 86-game suspension. Floyd Mayweather is a boxer, so beating people up is kind of his thing. But there are lines that shouldn't be crossed, like not beating up people who aren't boxers. Alas, Mayweather has a reputation for beating up his romantic partners, though that hasn't hurt his career much, and he's dismissed those accusations as just allegations. And that's just how he treats the people who are closest to him. Mayweather loves to say he appreciates his fans, although his actions say otherwise. For a start, there was that time when he defiantly dropped a fortune on Gucci merchandise because everyone else was boycotting the company over a sweater that looked an awful lot like blackface. Then there was the time he said he'd never give money to an African charity because Africa had never done anything for him. I'm not an African-American. I'm an American. In 2016, Mayweather was accused of threatening a fan who asked to take his photo at a pool party. He reportedly said, How would you like it if I asked to take a picture of you and your wife on vacation? Afterward, witnesses say he pumped his fists and said, quote, I will f him up. Michael Jordan is an outsized star with an outsized ego. Just consider his 2009 Hall of Fame acceptance speech, in which he spent 23 minutes mocking his family, airing past grievances, and throwing sarcasm at the Hall itself. I had a lot of family, a lot of friends I had to bring in, so thank you, Hall of Fame, for, for raising ticket prices, I guess. <laughs> Jordan's ego also appears to be a source of conflict with his fans, too. When he met rapper Chameleon Air in 2009 after the latter had just spent $7,000 at a charity auction to buy one of Jordan's jerseys, he was a special kind of jerk and didn't seem to care how many people knew it. Chameleon Air approached Jordan at a party and asked if he could get a picture, to which Jordan replied, quote, I ain't taking pictures with no Chameleon Air then tried to defuse the situation by explaining how he just bought one of Jordan's jerseys, so Jordan hit back. You know what? I tell you what. You pay $15,000 right now for a jersey from me, and I'll take a picture with you. So yeah, Michael Jordan is that kind of jerk. Most star athletes are remembered for their game first and their personality second. Tennis great John McEnroe is one of the few athletes whose negative personality is so well known that it transcended the sport. He was renowned for his volatile temper, which he often directed at fans. During his career, news stories about McEnroe dedicated almost as much time to his tantrums as to his game. During a senior tournament in 2000, he questioned a line call during a game, and when a heckler shouted at him in frustration, he turned around and replied, you got an appointment to get to? What the f do you care? But that was tame compared to some of the things he said earlier in his career. In a 1987 match against Germany's Boris Becker, McEnroe insulted the French people when a spectator shouted, You can't trust a frog to a French umpire, and McEnroe replied, quote, You better believe it. Then he insulted the Germans when he told a fan to, quote, Eat some more sauerkraut. And then he insulted people of African descent when he told a black linesman that he didn't know that they had black Germans. So not only is McEnroe a jerk to his fans, he's also kind of racist. You can't be serious, man. You cannot be serious! Baseball star Albert Bell was also known for his volatile temper and contempt for fans. In 1991, someone was heckling him about his alcohol problem when he threw a baseball at the guy, striking him in the chest. Bell had recently completed 10 weeks of alcohol rehab, so the fact that the fan was heckling him about it was not cool. But it was still on Bell to keep his emotions in check, regardless of how obnoxious the fan was. That wasn't the only incident when Bell's temper was on display for all to see. According to ESPN, his bad behavior went all the way back to his college days, when he was suspended for chasing a heckling fan through the stands. While playing in the minors, he trashed a bathroom after a disappointing game. And in 1997, he was fined $5,000 for reportedly making an obscene gesture to fans. At the very least, you can say he was consistent about the way he behaved. Everyone loves mascots. You know, those cuddly cartoon characters with oversized heads that roam the sidelines of sports events, cajoling fans to cheer at their nutty antics. Yeah. They're great, except for the part where they're pretty much universally creepy beyond measure. The giant eyes with their fixed stare. The mouth, frozen in a psychotic smile, hungering for souls. The fact that there's a living human being trapped inside, it's almost like they're designed to terrify us. 
I am going to stop pollution with my new lovable character, Gary the No Trash Cougar. So which of these anthropomorphized hellspawn are the absolute worst of the worst? Here's a look at some of the creepiest sports mascots of all time. King Cake Baby. This abomination from the New Orleans Pelicans is so horrifying. Even the team has embraced its inherent creepiness. The Pelicans claimed this thing was created to celebrate a New Orleans tradition that involves baking an effigy of a baby into a cake, which is weird. It looks more like they were pitching ideas for the next Exorcist sequel. King Cake Baby is just so fundamentally wrong on every possible level. It makes you wonder if sports are really worth it. Hip Hop the Rabbit It's hard to believe, but once upon a time, someone at the Philadelphia 76ers actually said out loud some version of this sentence. We should get a giant muscular rabbit to make our fans love us. Because <laughs> that always works. Normally, someone would follow that up by saying, put down the bottle, Bill. But no. Instead, the Sixers went for it and created Hip Hop. Not to mention his sidekick, Lil Hip Hop. Say what you will about the Sixers, but to their credit, at least they eventually decided to kill off Hip Hop once and for all. Woo Shock we can't be the first to point out that the mascot for Wichita State University looks suspiciously like Gordon Ramsay with jaundice. In reality, Wushok is meant to be a fighting mad shock of wheat, which, same thing. There have been several variations of Wushok since he first appeared in 1948, but they share one defining trait. They're all insanely creepy. Bolt Man. Maybe the creepiest thing about the San Diego Chargers Bolt Man is the fact that he's not even an official mascot. That's right, a fan named Dan Jureggi actually decided to become his own nightmare by creating a Bolt Man costume and wearing it to every game. Things took a bizarre turn though when he signed a deal with the Chargers to become their official mascot only to sue them later for breach of contract when they didn't pay him. According to the lawsuit, the Bolt Man costume cost $15,000. Here's a tip. Next time, make sure your team actually wants your help before you blow your life savings on a big yellow head. Junta. Junta is the official mascot of the German soccer team Borussia Mönchengladbach. And why any team would handpick a psychotic horse thing to be their official mascot is anyone's guess. He's named for one of the team's most beloved players, Gunter Netzer. Junta also has his own column in the team's magazine as well as a section on their home page. Look at all those kids just, just loving Junta. Yup. Suri. Here are the facts as we know them. Suri created for the 2011 Copa America soccer tournament in Argentina is supposed to be a rhea, which is a kind of flightless bird like an ostrich. But while this is cute, this is more like Big Bird's sad, creepy cousin. There's no logical way to explain the head and the neck on this thing. Not to mention the eyes and those eyebrows. Let's, let's just move on. Dandy. Let's learn the story of Dandy, which is what the New York Yankees named this thing. Get it? Yankee? Dandy? That's right, a hilarious Yankee doodle joke. The real joke was on the Yankees though. Back in 1978, owner George Steinbrenner found out that the Philly fanatic was making a ton of money for the Phillies, so he decided to commission a mascot for the Yankees. One problem, both Steinbrenner and everyone else associated with the team hated mascots. As a result, despite signing Dandy to a two-year contract, New York only used him for a few weeks, essentially paying him not to play for the rest of his deal. Neve and Gliz. The Olympic Games have historically had some pretty weird mascots, but few of them nail the concept of a child's innocence trapped forever in a cartoon purgatory quite like Neve and Gliz, the mascots for the 2006 Turin Winter Olympics. <laughs> for the record, the designer of these two walking nightmares claims that they are a humanized snowball and ice cube who represents friendship and joy. The concepts of friendship and joy must be very, very different in Italy because those two things look a whole lot like the animated ball of sadness in that antidepressant commercial. 
but if you thought nothing could quite be as creepy as Italian Olympic mascots Neve and Gliz, the 2012 London Games have something to say to you. Challenge accepted. Wenlock and Mandeville Say hello to your new friends, Wenlock and Mandeville, which strongly resemble those wriggly things you see in a drop of swamp water under a microscope. Only huge and with one giant, horrific, ever-staring eyeball. Wenlock and Mandeville starred in a series of animated cartoons and had their own theme song titled On a Rainbow. You can even bring the nightmare home with you. Not coincidentally, British child therapists have Wenlock to thank for their huge surge in business in 2012. A sports career can be over in an instant, but some of these stars overcame their tragedies with a new lease on life. Goalie Clint Malarchuk played in the NHL for 11 seasons and has coached for several major and minor league teams. But despite everything else he has done in the sport, he will always be best known for surviving one of the most horrifying sports accidents ever aired on television. It happened on March 22, 1989. Malarchuk was in net for the Buffalo Sabres when St. Louis Blues player Steve Tuttle crashed into him. Tuttle's skate flipped up and slashed Malarchuk's throat wide open, severing his carotid artery. Malarchuk collapsed and was only saved by the quick thinking of the team trainer Jim Pizzatelli who happened to be a former army medic who had served in the Vietnam War. Drawing on his combat experience, Pizzatelli managed to stabilize Malarchuk long enough to get him to the hospital. He only missed a handful of games before returning to the ice. At just 13 years old, professional surfer Bethany Hamilton was already on her way to stardom, having won two junior titles. But both her career and life were put in jeopardy on October 31, 2003, when Hamilton was attacked by a 14-foot tiger shark an attack that completely severed her left arm below the shoulder. A friend fashioned a tourniquet out of a surfboard leash and rushed her to the hospital. Despite losing more than 60% of her blood and going into shock, Hamilton somehow survived. She returned to surfing and has won several titles and a storied career that continues to this day. Her inspirational story was the basis of the hit film Soul Surfer, and she is also the subject of the documentary Bethany Hamilton, Unstoppable. During an interview about the documentary, she told The Guardian, My fear of losing surfing was greater than my fear of sharks. Professional stock car racer Mike Harmon has competed in more than 250 races over the course of his career. But he will always be remembered for a terrifying incident. It was during a practice session at Bristol Motor Speedway in August 2002, when Harmon crashed into the track's entry gate. The gate swung open, and Harmon's car hit the exposed corner of the wall head-on. The car literally split in half, right down the middle. Even worse? Yes, amazingly, it gets worse. The remnants of the car were then obliterated by the car of Johnny Sauter, who had been racing right behind Harmon. Luckily, Sauter hit the half of the car that Harmon wasn't in. Through a combination of that and some other incredible miracle, Harmon wasn't even injured and walked away from the crash completely unharmed. Talk about luck! In 1986, rugby star Wayne Shelford of the New Zealand All Blacks earned the unofficial title of Toughest Man to Ever Live when he survived an absolutely gruesome accident on the pitch. It happened in a match against France that was so violent, it earned the nickname the Battle of Nance. At the bottom of a massive pileup, Shelford was struck in the groin by an opposing player's boot. The player's cleats ripped Shelford's scrotum open, leaving one of his testicles dangling free in the wind. Any normal man would have dropped dead on the spot. But Shelford not only survived, he actually asked the team trainer to stitch his scrotum back together so he could return to the game. In a wide-ranging interview with Stuff, he said, Getting torn down below wasn't that painful, but the actual concussion lasted about three or four weeks. Kevin Pierce was one of the biggest, brightest stars on the professional snowboarding circuit. At the 2008 X Games, he became the first athlete in X Games history to win three medals in a single day, bagging awards in the Superpipe, Slopestyle, and Big Air competitions. But his rising star was suddenly eclipsed on December 31, 2009. While training for the 2010 Winter Olympics, Pierce attempted a difficult maneuver called the Cab Double Cork. It went terribly wrong, and he smashed his head directly into the halfpipe. He was airlifted to a hospital with massive brain trauma, which he somehow survived. So he would spend the next six months in the hospital. And I mean, I had to relearn how to walk and talk, and I had to learn how to swallow again, and I had to learn everything from the start. In 2010, he bravely returned to snowboarding, but only recreationally. 
His career was officially ended by the accident that he was lucky to survive. According to Today, he has found new passions in things like meditation, yoga, and philanthropy. Unlike most of the athletes we've mentioned, Steve Yeager is actually best known for his sporting accomplishments rather than his accident. He won the World Series MVP in 1981 with the Los Angeles Dodgers as part of a 15-year Major League career. But it's a miracle he even had that opportunity given the life-threatening freak injury he experienced back in 1976. Yeager was waiting in the on-deck circle when the bat of his teammate Bill Russell shattered. A jagged chunk of wood splintered off the bat and flew directly into Yeager's throat, lodging in his esophagus. Yeager collapsed, blood spurting from his neck, and he was rushed off for emergency surgery. The immediate action saved his career, his esophagus, and his life, and it also inspired the invention of the throat protector now worn by baseball catchers around the world. I just want to play. That's the important thing to me is playing the game of baseball, doing what I can do the best, and that's go out there and try to do what I can, what I can do. Jessica Dubay and Bryce Davison were one of Canada's top up-and-coming pair skaters when they entered the Four Continents Ice Skating Championship in Colorado Springs in 2007. Just the year prior, they placed in the top 10 of the World Figure Skating Championships. Dubay and Davison were also a dynamic duo who, although speaking different languages, were of the same mind and always in sync. But that chemistry broke for a crucial moment during their routine when Davis and Dubay launched into a side-by-side -side flying camel which involves extending a leg while spinning. Spinning somewhere between 40 to 60 miles per hour, Davison's blade came too close to his partner on his third revolution, slicing Dubay in the face. Dubay fell as blood spilled onto the ice. She was given morphine and rushed to a nearby hospital, where the laceration cut into her cheek and nose and required surgery. She was given 80 stitches, and both she and Davison underwent post-traumatic stress counseling. Davison said he knew they were getting too close right before it happened, and he dealt with immense guilt in the aftermath. The injury could have been worse, either by hitting her eye or jugular vein. But only 10 days after the accident, the pair returned to skating and placed 7th in that year's World Championships. The two went on to have fruitful careers and received a bronze medal at the 2008 competition. It's such a big surprise to be like on, on the podium, and I'm just so happy. <laughs> In what has been called the most violent hit in NFL history, New England Patriots receiver Daryl Stingley was left paralyzed. Stingley was 26 years old and a five-year veteran for the Patriots on the night of August 12, 1978. He ran a slant while his quarterback Steve Grogan threw the ball over the middle. Just as Stingley reached for the ball, Raiders safety Jack Tatum, who was called the assassin for his violent style of play, lunged at him. Tatum lowered his shoulder and bore his helmet and forearm into Stingley's face mask. It was a routine hit for Tatum, who was never apologetic for his aggressiveness and expected Stingley to get right back up. But Stingley didn't, he lay unconscious. Stingley was put on a stretcher and taken to a nearby hospital, where he stayed for three months. The hit dislocated two vertebrae in his neck, effectively damaging his spinal cord. The injury made him quadriplegic, and he depended on a wheelchair after. He may have survived the hit in the following years, but the injuries ended up taking a toll. He died in 2007, and his autopsy revealed that his spinal injury was a contributing factor. Although his hit was brutal, Tatum was never fined since it wasn't illegal. In the aftermath, NFL team owners agreed to NFLPA's demands to grant disability compensation to players injured because of the game. Ideally, Napoleon McCallum should be remembered for taking time off from the NFL to serve for the U.S. Navy aboard the USS California in the Indian Ocean. But one footnote in his career ended up epitomizing how brutal the sport could be. Four years after returning from service, McCallum played the 1994 season opener with the team that drafted him, the Los Angeles Raiders. The group was on the road, and their opponents were the San Francisco 49ers. In a play that changed his life, he was tackled by Ken Norton Jr. The hard-to-watch video of the injury shows Norton landing on McCallum's leg, causing it to bend in the wrong direction. His left knee was hyperextended, leaving a ruptured artery, three torn ligaments, and nerve damage. His calf and hamstring muscles were cleaned off the bone. This would be his final play of the night and maybe his final play for some time. Even with the grotesque injury, McCallum had hoped for recovery and a return to the field, but his doctor dampened those hopes 
telling him that his career was effectively over. What's more, the fate of McCallum's leg depended on a successful surgery. If it didn't go well, his leg could get amputated. Thankfully, the surgery went well, although there were six in total not counting the physical therapy for sports casting. Although football ended for McCallum, he kept active after his recovery by running, cycling, swimming, and playing basketball per the Los Angeles Times. He also didn't blame anyone and didn't think it was a vicious play. On October 29, 2017, Chicago Bears tight end Zach Miller experienced a hyperextension of the knee during a bad fall in the end zone. The Bears were losing 14-3 to the New Orleans Saints when quarterback Mitch Trubisky threw the ball toward Miller. If everything went perfectly, Miller would have caught it. Miller initially made the catch as ruled for a touchdown, but there were some unintended consequences. Just as he caught it, with the defender pushing him from behind, Miller landed awkwardly, with his left knee hyperextending and bending in the wrong direction. To add insult to injury, literally, instant replay overturned the call on the field. It went down as an incomplete pass. At first, Zach Miller thought he only tore his ACL. He didn't understand the severity of it until he was on the stretcher receiving well wishes from teammates. Miller recalled his leg appearing blue and swollen, and when he was placed into the ambulance, he lost feeling in his leg. It was an hour before he received emergency surgery, and the tissue in his leg had already begun to wither from blood loss and a lack of oxygen. His doctors told him he was only minutes away from being amputated. Luckily, he was able to avoid that scenario and was walking again not a year later. After nine surgeries and an attempt at a comeback, Miller finally retired in 2019. Montreal Canadiens forward Trent McCleary was seconds away from death after a slap shot stuck a hockey puck into his neck. It was January 29, 2000, when McCleary put himself in between Philadelphia Flyers defenseman Chris Terrien and Canadiens goaltender Jeff Hackett. At first, McCleary thought the puck would hit his shin guard, but then he realized how high it was flying. Before he knew it, it hit his throat. He lay on the ice, spitting up large amounts of blood. He couldn't breathe, which confused him, but he was able to stand up and skate to his bench. Moments later, he lost consciousness. It turned out McCleary had a fractured larynx and a collapsed lung. He required an emergency tracheotomy while still wearing his hockey gear and skates. And for 24 hours, he was in critical condition. For a while, he couldn't speak. McCleary, who suffered two other major injuries in his career, tried to make a comeback, but his oxygen supply never recovered. He began his second career as a financial advisor and now coaches a Bantam hockey team on the side. McCleary believes that the puck hit him in the unluckiest spot possible, where it would do the most damage, but he still doesn't regret his block and has gone so far to say that he would do it again if he could. Some athletes rise to the top of their sports and stay in the spotlight seemingly forever, like Michael Jordan or David Beckham, sticking around as coaches or commentators and making bank doing commercials. But not every former athlete takes that road. Some end up taking regular 9-to-5 jobs just like the rest of us. Here's a look at some ex-professional sports stars who now work regular jobs. Tito Santana in the 1980s, Tito Santana was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the likes of Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior in the WWF, appearing in each of the first nine WrestleManias. After retiring from wrestling, though, Santana rejoined the workforce under his real name, Merced Solis, becoming a middle school Spanish teacher in New Jersey. We'd hate to be the kid who turns in homework late. I know I'm making a difference. You know, it feels good. Carrie Strug she became a national hero after triumphantly winning gold at the 1996 Olympics despite competing on a badly injured ankle. But after the spotlight faded, Carrie Strug first went to school, earning a degree in sociology from Stanford, and then she went to work. After spending some time working as a second grade teacher, Strug moved on to government work and is now listed as a grant manager at the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Can I say a little prayer? That's so sweet. I know it is, isn't it? <laughs> Vin Baker Though he played in the NBA for 13 years and made several all-star teams, Vin Baker's career was cut short due to addiction and substance abuse, costing him a small fortune. After getting sober, though, Baker turned his life around, thanks in part to his one-time boss, former Supersonics team owner Howard Schultz. Schultz also happened to be the CEO of Starbucks, so he offered Baker a job as a barista. It might seem like a humbling experience to a former superstar athlete, but Baker used the opportunity to get his life back on track, and he stayed clean and sober ever since. I consider Howard family and a close friend, and he did take a, a chance on me, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. Randy Johnson 
One of the most intimidating pitchers in baseball history, Hall of Famer Randy Johnson stands 6 feet 10 inches tall. These days, he also stands tall in the world of photography, as he's left baseball behind to found his own business, Randy Johnson Photography. A photojournalism major at USC before turning pro, Johnson is known for his excellent concert photography, having taken pictures on tour with Metallica, Kiss, and Rush, among others. He's also photographed USO tours and gone to Africa to capture images of wildlife. His business logo also features wildlife, the dove that he accidentally clobbered with a pitch in 2001. Carl Malone Two-time NBA MVP and Olympic Dream Teamer Carl Malone was also a 14-time NBA All-Star. After leaving the NBA, though, Malone didn't rest on his laurels, instead branching out into all sorts of entrepreneurial enterprises. And he's very hands-on. Besides owning several fast food and automotive franchises, the Deseret News reported that he not only owned a trucking company, he actually drives the trucks himself because, simply, he loves trucking. Where's this going? <laughs> Someone about to get their ass kicked. Mark Wollers Relief pitcher Mark Wollers spent 12 years in Major League Baseball, mostly with the Atlanta Braves, famously throwing a pitch 103 miles per hour on one occasion. After developing the yips, though, he retired and became a real estate agent. These days, he and his wife are selling houses in Atlanta, setting up clients with savings, and closing deals, instead of setting up closers for a save and dealing strikes. Pretty neat. Antoine Walker After being drafted sixth overall in the NBA's 1996 draft by the Boston Celtics, Antoine Walker went on to become a three-time All-Star and NBA champ, earning more than $100 million over the course of 13 seasons. But in 2010, just two years after he retired, Walker declared bankruptcy. Nowadays, Walker works as a financial consultant for Morgan Stanley, teaching young athletes how not to spend their money and ensuring they don't make the same mistakes he did. Talk about making lemonade out of lemons. Adrian Dantley with 23,177 points over 15 seasons, six-time NBA All-Star and Hall of Famer Adrian Dantley was ninth on the all-time scoring list at the time of his retirement. After a stint in coaching, though, Dantley turned to a totally unexpected career. The Washington Post reported in 2013 that he was working as a crossing guard for $14,000 a year. Turned out he didn't need the money or anything. He just wanted to keep busy and help the local community. Now that's true all-star behavior. Oh, it definitely have meaning and uh, I feel like I'm doing something helping the community and it's all about the kids. Athletes are icons, role models, and heroes. So it's always an unspeakable loss when one leaves this world far too soon. These sports stars all met tragic ends when they passed away in freak accidents. Kobe Bryant had one of the most legendary careers in NBA history. He won five championships, and was an All-Star 18 times before his retirement in 2016. On January 26, 2020, Bryant was on board a helicopter with his 13-year-old daughter, Gianna. He was heading up to Thousand Oaks to coach Gianna's basketball team, along with seven other passengers, when the vehicle crashed northwest of Los Angeles. No one on board survived the impact. The other victims included the pilot, a baseball coach, and some other young basketball players and their parents and family members. Moments of silence, speeches, artwork, memorials, and public services soon followed as loved ones, colleagues, and fans across the world paid tribute. Gold and purple were everywhere for months. That was just the beginning to a particularly turbulent year that also included a presidential impeachment, a contentious election, impassioned civil rights demonstrations, and of course, a deadly pandemic that took millions of lives and sent the global economy into a spiral. The 2001 Daytona 500 race was one of the most anticipated events in NASCAR history. Ads were everywhere, including expensive TV spots during the NFL playoffs. The race would end up being one of the most talked about in the sports history, but not for the reasons anyone hoped. Even if you weren't a NASCAR fan, Dale Earnhardt was inescapable. Despite several serious recent injuries at the time, including a broken collarbone. The seven-time Winston Cup champ had no respect for safety guidelines. He even reportedly made a point of not appearing at an event where NASCAR officials brought in an automotive safety expert to pitch its benefits. Alas, that might have saved his life. On lap 180 of the big race, Earnhardt's Monte Carlo crashed into a concrete barrier after colliding with another driver. 
The impact measured about 60 Gs of force, which wrecked the car and inflicted numerous injuries on Earnhardt. He suffered a broken ankle, broken ribs, a fractured sternum, cuts to his scalp and chin, and a fatal fracture that included breaks in all of the bones where the skull meets the spine. All of this happened within the span of 80 milliseconds, and suddenly, Dale Sr. was gone. Dale Earnhardt Jr. recalled to ESPN, Having Dad was like a cheat sheet, like knowing all the answers to everything, and I was like, man, I'm gonna have to do this without that for the rest of my life. And I'm proud of who he was. If I never do another thing in this sport, what matters to me is that his legacy stays that way. Legendary runner Steve Prefontaine made an impact that punched well above the weight class his single, relatively unspectacular Olympics appearance would suggest. Nevertheless, he was a high school prodigy and a peerless college performer who inspired countless young runners to dust off their sneakers and hit the road. He was later the subject of multiple movies, and he ultimately became a major influence on the explosion of popularity that long-distance running enjoyed in the 70s. That's why it was no surprise that Prefontaine's death devastated the running community and the world at large. In 1975, Pre tragically rolled his convertible and became pinned beneath it. He was gone before help could arrive. As Sports Illustrated writer and Olympic runner Kenny Moore remembered him, he was so open and inviting. He had the crowd. There was nothing like him. We all feel something when the crowd goes crazy, but he gave more. It's a matter of degrees. No one gave as much as he did. It's always tragic when athletes are cut down in their prime, but there's something particularly sad about those who meet their demise right after their career has begun. In the case of Nick Adenhart, who joined the Los Angeles Angels in 2009 at the age of 22, he also had to recover from a serious elbow injury to get to where he was. Then, through no fault of his own, his story came to an abrupt end when the car he was in was struck by a drunk driver in a minivan who had just run a red light. Adenhart passed away during surgery. Two other passengers died on the scene, and a fourth ultimately managed to recover. The driver fled the scene, but was arrested later that night. At the next Angels game, Nick's father Jim walked out onto the pitcher's mound, stood in silence before the crowd, and covered his face with his hands. During a news conference, Angels manager Mike Socia said, It is a tragedy that will never be forgotten. Meanwhile, Aiden Hart's agent, Scott Boris, recalled through tears. He told his dad that he'd better come here that something special was going to happen. He was so elated, he felt like a major leaguer. He was one of the, a bright personality, always had a smile, was very engaging, and those are the people you, you definitely miss. Even though much of pro wrestling is staged, that doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Grapplers can suffer severe lifelong injuries or even death. As in the case of Canadian grappler Owen Hart, he suffered a fatal accident in 1999 before his match even began. About 75 minutes into the televised Over the Edge event, Hart was being lowered into the ring to compete in front of 16,000 spectators at Kansas City's Kemper Arena. According to eyewitnesses, the cable holding him either snapped or disconnected, sending Hart tumbling 50 feet below. He died after hitting his head on impact. Pay-per-view audiences mercifully didn't see the accident, instead seeing a highlight reel of Hart's greatest moments. A paramedic who rushed to the scene after the accident commented that she didn't think the cable snapped. As she noted to reporters, he was supposed to be lowered down into the ring. It didn't get hooked onto him. He thought it was hooked on. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the audience initially didn't realize that Hart's fall wasn't just a part of the act. As one 15-year-old spectator commented, We thought it was a doll at first. We thought they were just playing with us. We were really shocked when we found out that it was no joke. Canadian skier Sarah Burke had successfully pulled off a 540 flat spin on a 22-foot halfpipe countless times in practice runs before her final attempt. She'd all but mastered the move to the point that she had a reasonable expectation of landing it for years to come. Unfortunately, her attempt to pull off the trick on January 10, 2012 turned tragic. The tumble she took didn't look terribly threatening initially, but when she didn't get up after the fall, those who tried to help her found that she had no pulse and wasn't breathing. Nine days later, Burke died at the hospital of hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, a condition in which oxygen deprivation leads to brain damage. She was only 29. Burke's loss was a stunning blow to her loved ones and anyone involved with the Winter X Games. The tributes that poured in noted that she'd also been highly influential at the Olympics, as she'd successfully pushed to have the halfpipe added as an event at the Winter Games. As Peter Judge, CEO of the Canadian Freestyle Ski Association noted, she was doing a trick she was well-versed in, the conditions were good, and everything seemed normal. That mitigates a lot of that sort of introspection. The spirit of Sarah is just, she, she went through life fearlessly and gracefully. 
Imagine training your entire life for something spectacular and being so close to pulling it off, only to have it all ruined at the last possible second because of a single stray dog walking on the street. That may sound ridiculous, but that actually was the reason for a terrible tragedy. Portuguese cycling hero Joaquim Agostinho was a six-time consecutive Portuguese biking champion who also finished the Tour de France 12 of the 13 times that he participated. He finished third in that particular race on two separate occasions, in addition to numerous other accolades over the course of his career. Tragically, it all came to an abrupt end on April 30, 1984. Agostinho, who was just 41 years old, was nearing the finish line of a race when a dog wandered onto the path. He tried to swerve but couldn't. Instead, colliding with the poor animal and crashing into the pavement head first, Agostinho got back on the bike afterward and even finished the race before undergoing surgery 10 hours later in Lisbon. Unfortunately, the injury was far more serious than he was willing to admit and 10 days after fracturing his skull in the accident, he passed away. You'd be absolutely stunned and heartbroken to discover how many promising athletes have been killed in airplane or helicopter crashes. One of the most tragic and deadliest examples was a 2011 crash in Yaroslavl, Russia, that killed 44 out of the 45 people on board. In an instant, the entire locomotive Yaroslavl hockey team was taken away by an unimaginable tragedy. It wasn't just players who passed away, as dozens of other members and coaches and assistants were also lost, wives were widowed, children lost their fathers, and parents lost their children. International hockey felt the loss as well. The Hockey News' Adam Proto wrote in 2021, Although Lokomotiv eventually moved forward after the tragedy and iced a KHL squad again, the spirit of those who perished still surrounds the team. It really doesn't feel like it's been a decade since we lost them. The pain is still raw for their friends, family, and teammates. You just can't even describe how sad the tragedy really is. It's just overpowering. New Zealander Jack Lovelock was a husband and father of two little kids who worked as a medical professional in 1949. However, most people remember him as a record-breaking track and field pioneer and an Olympic hero who nabbed his home country its first ever gold medal at the Summer Games. By the mid-30s, though, Lovelock's career aspirations in medicine and several injuries forced him to hang up his sneakers once and for all. Sadly, the problems didn't stop there. In the early 40s, Lovelock fell off a horse hit his head, and was unconscious for at least two days, perhaps unsurprisingly after such an injury. Dizziness and eyesight issues would plague Lovelock for the rest of his life, likely playing a major role in his death. On December 28, 1949, Lovelock was standing on a train platform when he called his wife and said that he felt too unwell to go to work. He would never make it home. Sick and dizzy, he fainted and fell onto the tracks. The oncoming train killed him instantly. Nowadays, batting helmets are required in baseball, but they haven't been around forever. In fact, back in the 1920s, nobody wore them at all. During one August 16, 1920 game, Raymond Chapman was at bat for the Cleveland Indians. A pitch by New York Yankee Carl May struck Chapman in the temple, sending him to the dirt. By the next morning, he had passed away. He's the only player in MLB history who's ever died after getting hit by a pitch, even though the league as a whole didn't require batting helmets until the 70s. There was another factor here that contributed to Chapman's fatal injury, the spitball. A since-banned pitch, it involves the pitcher spitting on the ball to alter its path. Mays was infamous for this type of practice and for occasionally hitting batters. But it wasn't until Chapman collapsed that Mays realized that the sound of the ball wasn't from the bat, but from the head of the man at the plate. Physical talent doesn't necessarily go hand in hand with sound morals. Over the decades, a number of successful athletes have demonstrated a less than perfect grasp of ethics and sportsmanship. With that in mind, check out this list of history's most corrupt athletes. Lenny Dykstra was an unlikely superstar. When he came up with the New York Mets in the 80s, nobody pegged him as a future franchise player. But then he bulked up, got traded to the Phillies, and became the team's driving force on their way to the 1993 World Series. At the height of his career, Dykstra was making more than $6 million per year. After retirement, Dykstra sought to reinvent himself as a businessman. He invested in a chain of car washes, which he sold for millions. Then he became something of a stock-picking guru and was hired to be a columnist for TheStreet.com. 
That in turn inspired him to launch The Players Club, a magazine and brokerage company focused on helping professional athletes invest and plan for retirement. Everything seemed to be going great, but it was all a front for an increasingly corrupt life, fueled by a drug habit that began during his playing days. The Players Club was a chaotic mess. After getting the debut magazine issue out the door, the company was drowning in debt. Dykstra started using his employees' credit cards to cover his costs, and his descent continued from there. By 2020, he'd been convicted of grand theft auto, financial fraud, and indecent exposure, to name just a few of his crimes. In 2000, Marion Jones was considered one of the greatest athletes in Olympic history. She just scored three gold and two bronze medals at the Sydney Games. Although there were rumors that she was using illegal performance-enhancing drugs, there was no evidence. She passed all of her drug tests until testing positive for a banned substance in 2006. But even then, a follow-up test cleared her. Jones took a break from the track to have a baby, and when she returned, she didn't perform up to her previous standards. In 2004, she was accused of using drugs by Victor Conte, the head of the Bay Area Laboratory Cooperative, which had supplied professional athletes with various steroid products. Jones sued and issued fierce denials. But then in 2007, the walls came tumbling down, as Jones admitted that she'd been doping for years and had lied about her involvement in a money laundering scheme. She was sentenced to six months in prison and was basically broke, despite once being a millionaire with several lucrative endorsement deals. How did this happen? How in the world is my worst nightmare actually happening? Lance Armstrong was a champion cyclist in his teens and early 20s, but then he was diagnosed with testicular cancer at the age of 25. After successfully battling the disease, he founded the Live Strong Foundation and went on to become the most dominant cyclist in history, winning seven consecutive Tour de France's. But today, Armstrong is better known as the ringleader of a sophisticated cheating scheme. In 2013, he finally admitted that he'd used a variety of performance-enhancing drugs during his storied career. He was then stripped of all of his Tour de France victories and banned from competition. His elaborate rule-breaking involved setting up doping labs in hotel rooms and bribing doctors and officials in order to escape detection. Armstrong also had to face a lawsuit brought against him by the United States Justice Department for unjust enrichment. He ultimately settled that suit for $6.65 million, a fraction of the fortune he'd built by cheating and a small amount of the $32.3 million paid to him over the years by the U.S. Postal Service, which had sponsored his Tour de France teams. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. Pete Rose was undoubtedly one of the best players in baseball history. The all-time leader in hits, he should have been remembered as a Hall of Fame caliber athlete. Instead, he's now largely known as the guy so corrupt that he actually placed bets on his own team. It was an open secret that Rose had a gambling problem as early as the 1970s, but since he restricted his bets to horse racing and other sports, it was considered a personal issue and had no effect on his playing and managing career. But that all changed in 1989, when he was manager of the Cincinnati Reds. He was accused of not just betting on baseball, but betting on the team that he was managing. As a result, he was banned for life from the game and is thus ineligible for Hall of Fame induction. Rose claimed that he never bet on baseball while he was playing, but a notebook kept by one of his associates shows that he did in fact do so, including on his own team's games. He's always maintained that he only bet on his team to win thereby implying that there would be no reason for him to throw a game. But that hasn't done much to change his reputation as one of the most corrupt athletes of all time. Pete, you're not supposed to be in the hall. Even at home? Denny McLean was once a baseball superstar. The last major league pitcher to win 30 games in a season, he won back-to-back -back Cy Young Awards in 1968 and 1969. But just a year later, everything went wrong. In 1970, his involvement with a bookmaking scheme run by the Syrian mob was revealed, and he was temporarily suspended from baseball, despite denying most of the charges. Without his baseball income, McLean declared bankruptcy, and when he returned to the game, he wasn't the same. He lost 22 games in 1971 and was out for good by 1972. It's been a long, slow slide into total corruption since then. McLean hustled golf for a while, 
Then he began a loan shark business and he even smuggled a wanted criminal out of the country in his airplane for $160,000. In 1985, he was sentenced to 23 years in prison for racketeering, conspiracy, extortion, and attempting to sell 3 kilograms of cocaine. He was released after 27 months, but in 1996, he was convicted of money laundering, conspiracy, theft, and mail fraud in a pension fraud scheme. At this point, it's easier to ask what crimes Denny McLean hasn't committed. After a solid college football career, Ray Carruth was selected in the first round of the 1997 NFL Draft, and he then signed a $3.7 million deal with a $1.3 million signing bonus. He got injured the next year, but by 1999, he was back on the comeback trail. But trouble was brewing. He was worried about the child support he owed to Sharika Adams, a woman he'd gotten pregnant so he decided to have her killed. He was already paying $5,500 per month to the mother of his first child and chafed at the responsibility. His brilliant plan to avoid paying out more was to hire a man named Van Brett Watkins to murder Adams before she gave birth. Not only did Carruth hire a killer, he also participated directly in the murder himself. He and Adams went out to the movies, but he insisted on taking separate cars. While driving home, he suddenly stopped in the road, forcing Adams to stop behind him. Watkins pulled up alongside and shot her. She died, but her unborn son survived. Carruth attempted to flee to California, but he was arrested, tried, and convicted. He was sentenced to a minimum of 18 years and 11 months in prison. He was released in October 2018. Now starting his life over at the age of 44. It's hard to avoid O.J. Simpson in any discussion of the most corrupt athletes of all time. He was once upon a time a beloved celebrity whose incredible athletic talent led to business opportunities and an acting career. But then, it all began spiraling downward in 1994. That was when his estranged wife, Nicole Brown Simpson, and her acquaintance, Ron Goldman, were brutally killed. Simpson then led police on an infamous car chase, but he ultimately was acquitted after a sensational trial. Goldman's family was outraged, and they brought a civil wrongful death suit against Simpson. In 1997, a jury found Simpson liable for the deaths of his wife and Goldman, ordering him to pay the Goldman family $33.5 million. Simpson then slid further into corruption as he tried to evade consequences. He attempted to publish an incredibly tasteless book describing how he would have committed the murders if he'd actually done it, but the Goldmans were awarded the rights to the book. Simpson began working hard to hide his assets, and in 2007, he entered a new phase of criminality when he hatched a scheme to steal back some memorabilia via armed robbery. He was ultimately sentenced to 33 years in prison for the robbery. He served nine and was released on parole in 2017. Gambling addiction took everything away from Art Schleister, a once promising football player who was the fourth overall pick by the Baltimore Colts in the 1982 NFL Draft, Schleister couldn't resist the thrill of illegal gambling. He received a $350,000 signing bonus from the Colts, along with a low-interest loan of $125,000 from the team's owner. By the end of the year, he owed all of that and more to his bookies. In 1983, Schleister was suspended from the NFL due to his gambling. Worried that he would be asked to throw games, he called the FBI and confessed to his gambling. That act of contrition gave him another chance in the NFL, but by 1987, he was out of the sport and arrested for illegal betting. He still almost managed to turn it around. He signed with the Arena Football League and was named MVP in 1990, but he never really stopped gambling and has been in and out of jail for various crimes like writing bad checks, forgery, and fraud ever since. In 2011, Schleister was arrested for a breathtakingly corrupt scheme in which he took money in exchange for hard-to-get tickets, like the Super Bowl. But he simply kept the money and never had any tickets to sell. This crime earned him an 11-year prison sentence. South African cricketer Hansen Cronier never met a match he couldn't be paid to throw, and it may have gotten him killed. Cronier was a hero to his country and a captain of the national cricket team in the 1990s. He was first approached by gamblers about throwing a cricket match in 1995, at which time he refused. But just a year later, he accepted $30,000 to persuade his teammates to throw a match. He didn't even actually convey the offer to his teammates. Instead, he kept all the money himself. 
Cronier had apparently discovered that his true love was money. He had no fewer than 72 bank accounts in the Cayman Islands. He admitted to accepting at least $130,000 from gamblers to throw matches between 1996 and 2000. However, it's widely suspected that he accepted a lot more cash, threw many more matches, and convinced many more players to cheat. Some even suspect that his death in a plane crash in 2002 wasn't an accident, but a targeted killing, to make sure that the secrets he knew about corruption in the sport remained unspoken. If you think corrupt athletes are a modern affliction, think again. As dramatized in the film Eight Men Out, in 1919, eight members of the Chicago White Sox agreed to throw the World Series in exchange for a total payout of about $100,000, roughly equivalent to $1.5 million today. First baseman C. Arnold Chick Gandal met with gambler and gangster Joseph Sullivan, and then Gandal conveyed the scheme to seven of his teammates. One of them, Buck Weaver, was largely innocent. Although involved in the very early stages, he quickly pulled out but he was accused and punished with the rest. Shoeless Joe Jackson, one of the greatest hitters of his generation, always insisted that he played his best, although he accepted about $5,000 from the gamblers. The players weren't convicted of anything, in part because key evidence mysteriously disappeared. But baseball had recently installed a commissioner, Kennesaw Mountain Landis, who was determined to preserve the sport's reputation. He banned all eight members of the White Sox for life, and they were given the nickname Black Sox. No player who throws a ball game will ever play professional baseball again. For most athletes who compete in the Olympics, it's the culmination of a lifetime of hard work and dedication. However, there are many crazy stories of Olympians who've had victory snatched from their grasp amid shocking circumstances. Here are the times athletes were stripped of their Olympic medals. In 2017, NBC Sports reported that 18 Russian medalists from the 2008 and 2012 Olympics had been disqualified for their association with doping scandals, and an additional 10 had their medals stripped because they had been on a team where at least one of the members had been caught doping. They were told to return their medals to the International Olympic Committee and promptly said, nope. Some said more than that. Maxim Dildin was disqualified from the relay in order to give his bronze medal back, to which he replied, I've got the medal at home, let them try to take it. That was in February, and by August, there were still clear holdouts. Reuters reported that among them was sprinter Tatiana Firova, who explained, I don't want to return my medals because I think no one would have deserved them more. That was, of course, in spite of testing positive for steroid use. When the media looked at whether or not the IOC could force them to give back the medals, the answer from experts and historians was pretty much, we don't know. The IOC, meanwhile, has been a bit mum of what they've actually gotten back. Romanian gymnast Andrea Radican won a gold at the 2000 Olympics for the individual all-around competition, and then it was almost immediately taken away. The reason was doping, but according to the New York Times, it's complicated. The then 16-year-old Radican tested positive for pseudoephedrine, which while being on the IOC's official list of banned substances, is probably also in the medicine cabinets of most homes. It's an over-the-counter cold medicine, and that's exactly what she'd taken. Not only had she taken it, but it was her trainer who gave her the meds to fight off flu symptoms. Radican appealed the decision, while the International Court of Arbitration for Sport agreed that she hadn't gained any advantage from taking the medicine, they also argued that anti-doping rules, quote, must be enforced without compromise. Not only did they refuse to return her medal and title, but her doctor was banned from the remainder of the games, as well as the next two games. Radican later said, I am disappointed. It's not for me to judge the decision, but I am convinced, and my heart is at peace that I did everything right and competed fairly. In 2019, a film called The Golden Girl followed Radican's journey for redemption. Having gone on to become a journalist and sports announcer, she says that having all she'd worked for taken away because of a technicality means there's no chance of fairness with the IOC. Saying Usain Bolt is fast is the understatement of the year, and he famously has a ton of Olympic medals to prove it. But he'll always know that he should have had one more. In 2008, his team took the gold in the 4x100-meter relay. Then they had to give it right back. At first, everything looked on the up and up. However, when Bolt's teammate Nesta Carter was retested for doping, the results came back positive for one of the stimulants on the IOC's no-fly list. 
The retesting was done after officials realized just how far Russia's doping scandal reached. That said, the Jamaican relay team sort of got caught in the fallout. Weirdly, retests aren't entirely unheard of, and urine samples from athletes are often saved in case of the development of new, more precise technologies that can be used to detect illicit substances. Bolt was, predictably, not thrilled about the whole team losing their medals because of one person. He told NBC Sports, I'm not happy about it, but it's just one of those things that happen in life. But I can't allow that to deter me from my focus this season, so I am focused, but I am not pleased about the situation. It wasn't until 2010 that Chinese gymnast Deng Fo Shao had the bronze medal she'd won in the 2000 Sydney Olympics taken away, and according to the Wall Street Journal, it's entirely possible that it was only because of her own oopsie. When registering for the 2000 Olympics, they note that she had applied with a birth date of January 20th, 1983. That would have made her 17 years old at the time of the competition, a year over the minimum age requirement of 16. But when the 2008 Olympics rolled around, she listed her birth date as January 23rd, 1986. That meant at the time she competed in 2000, she had only been 14 years old, well under the minimum age requirement. Her bronze medal was stripped and given to the U.S., but the evidence suggests that hers isn't the only such story. There were further investigations into the Chinese women's gymnastics teams in 2008, and although those girls were ultimately found to be old enough to compete, USA Gymnastics made it very clear that they doubted the verdict and condemned the pressure put on pre-teen girls to not only compete, but to lie about their age to do so. Keen O'Connor was one of the youngest show jumpers in Ireland at the time he rode Waterford Crystal at the Athens Olympics in 2004. I mean, I've been lucky, I've had some great horses, some great results. O'Connor took the gold medal, but didn't quite take it home when tests on Waterford Crystals came back positive for two substances commonly used in humans as antipsychotics. O'Connor and his team said that yes, they'd given the horse the drugs as a sedative to keep him calm while he had been recovering from an injury, and it was when they appealed for a retest that things got really weird. That, says the Irish Times, is when someone intercepted the sample being sent for retesting, signed for it, then vanished. Things got even more complicated when there was a break-in at the Irish Equestrian Federation, and some uncomfortable files were released to the public. Namely, it was proof that another of O'Connor's horses had also tested positive for doping. That kicked off a whole media frenzy, and ultimately, he went through with his appeal even though there could be no retest. While the committee agreed that yes, they had given the horse the drugs in enough time that they should have been cleared out of his system by the Olympics, the bottom line was, they hadn't. As a result, O'Connor was stripped of his gold medal. Here's something of a complicated tale, and it starts with the 2004 Athens Olympics. That's when the International Olympic Committee handed down sanctions to Colombian cyclist Maria Luisa Calle Williams. Williams had a drug test come back positive for a banned substance called heptaminol, and as a result, she was stripped of the bronze medal she had won in the women's points race. That's by no means the end of the story, and Williams wholeheartedly denied ever taking any such substance. The New York Times later reported that Kaye Williams had appealed the ruling, stating that she had taken some headache medication that had resulted in a false positive for the banned substance. The Court of Arbitration for Sport ultimately agreed, and the bronze, which had been given to U.S. cyclist Erin Mirabella, was taken away from her and returned. Now, the footnote to the whole saga, in 2015, Kaye was competing at Toronto's Pan American Games when her drug test came back positive for another prohibited substance. Cycling News said she was given a four-year ban. The very first Olympic medal for snowboarding was awarded at the 1998 Winter Olympics in Nagano, and then it was promptly removed when gold medalist Ross Rebliati's drug test came back positive for marijuana. According to the Washington Post, Rebliati said that he personally hadn't smoked marijuana since April of the previous year. However, when friends had a pre-Olympics going away party for him, some of them had been smoking. He was in the room, and that's how it had gotten into his system. When it came time for the IOC to vote on whether he'd be handed a disqualification or just a slap on the wrist, it was pretty close. At the time, there were no specific limits on marijuana use, and while it wasn't listed as performance enhancing, it was controversial because it was said to be used to calm nerves. The ban actually didn't last long and was overturned before he even had a chance to give the medal back. The most important thing was to have the support of uh, our, my country and uh, my friends and my family. But still, that's not the end of the story. Rebliati later said, 
Cannabis was seen as being for losers and lazy stoners. I became a source of entertainment, a joke. He went on to embrace it though. With Canada's legalization of weed, he has since launched his own cannabis lifestyle brand called Legacy. The Smithsonian calls Jim Thorpe the greatest American Olympian of all time, but it's not a sentiment that's reflected in any official records. Why? It's a weird story. Thorpe, who was a Sac and Fox Native American who grew up hunting, riding, and working in what was then the Oklahoma Territory, famously broke a high school high jump record when he hopped over a bar set above his own height in work clothes. I think Jim Thorpe represents a lot of the American myth. When it came to the Olympics, Thorpe dominated in both the decathlon and pentathlon. That includes events like the Mile Run, which incidentally, he won wearing unmatched shoes and after competing in nine other events in less than 48 hours. Then, in 1912, six months after the competition, the IOC stripped Thorpe of his medals. Why? A few years prior, he had spent a season as a minor league ball player. The Olympics were only for amateurs, and that meant the $25 he'd made had made him ineligible. In spite of rules stating that Olympic medals could only be challenged for 30 days after competition, his medals were revoked. In spite of a massive movement to see the records change and the medals go back to Thorpe, the New York Times says that things still aren't right. In 1982, the IOC awarded him posthumous gold medals that came with a massive catch. The medals were his, but the official records and results of the Olympics he absolutely owned weren't going to be changed. So let's say you're traveling abroad and feeling kind of sick, so you grab some Vicks nasal spray. It's an easy decision that's definitely not going to get anyone in trouble, right? That's what the British skier Alan Baxter thought when he competed in the 2002 Olympics in Salt Lake City. According to the Telegraph, his bronze in the slalom made him the only Brit to place in the top three in any alpine skiing event. It was short-lived though, when he tested positive for methamphetamine. He was shocked, but a closer look at what he bought in a U.S. store made it pretty clear what had happened. In the U.K., Vicks nasal inhalers contain Siberian pine oil, camphor, and menthol as their active ingredients. In the U.S., however, the active ingredient is something called levmetaphetamine. He'd picked up an inhaler thinking it was the same completely inoffensive thing he was used to, but he found out the hard way that wasn't the case at all. Baxter appealed, and while the Court of Arbitration for Sport found him to be, quote, sincere and honest, and someone who never intended to obtain a competitive advantage in the race, they still ruled against Baxter and refused to give his medal back. Baxter later said that he was relieved to have at least been cleared of cheating and added that he hoped the rules would eventually change. Lance Armstrong's story is the stuff of legend. He was only 25 when he was diagnosed with testicular cancer, and post-treatment, he returned to the cycling world to take title after title. It wasn't long, however, before rumors of doping started circulating. Armstrong denied it until 2013, when he came clean during an interview with Oprah. Yes or no, did you ever take banned substances to enhance your cycling performance? Yes. The IOC immediately stripped Armstrong of his bronze medal from the 2000 Sydney Olympics, and it was almost as fast as the International Cycling Union took away his Tour de France honors too. It turned out that was just the beginning of the fall. Things only got worse when the United States Anti-Doping Agency released findings that not only had Armstrong been taking a Molotov cocktail of performance-enhancing drugs, but he'd been, quote, ruthlessly pressuring his teammates to do the same. The report included the insane lengths he had gone to, including things like turning hotel rooms into blood transfusion centers. A total of 26 people, including 11 of his former teammates, testified, and it led to the unfolding of a scandal that the USADA called the most sophisticated, personalized, and successful doping program that sport has ever seen. After Armstrong was stripped of his medal, NPR says it took him eight months to return it. The 2004 Athens Olympics set a record of their own. According to the Los Angeles Times, they were the first Olympic Games where more than one track and field competitor lost a medal for doping. But here's the thing, Hungarian discus thrower Robert Fazikas didn't actually test positive for drugs. He wasn't tested at all, because he struggled with giving a urine sample. Why? Because IOC rules dictate it's something that has to be done in front of witnesses. That's something that not many places include in the list of things you'll have to go through to compete in the Olympics. The IOC hinted at the fact they firmly believed 
that Fazekas couldn't fill the cup in front of onlookers because he knew he was going to fail and wanted to carry in a clean sample to submit instead. For his first sample, he produced just a third of the required amount, and when it came time to give a second, he outright refused. In the end, Fazekas was disqualified. His gold medal went to the next in line. A book published in 2012 by author Richard Moore called the men's 100-meter race at the 1988 Olympics the quote, dirtiest race in history, because out of the eight finalists, six would see their careers later tarnished by doping scandals. For one, gold medal winner Ben Johnson, it didn't take long at all. After Johnson won, he took part in a press conference where, in hindsight, he probably shouldn't have declared, this world record will last 50 years, maybe 100. A gold medal, that's something no one can take away from you. It turned out that when your drug test comes back positive for steroid use, they absolutely can take that gold medal away. And they did. Johnson, it turned out, had been using steroids for seven years by the time he competed. His trainer had started him on them saying that everyone was using, and it just leveled the playing field. It was so rampant that the area outside of the practice field at the 1987 World Championships was described by Moore as a quote, drugs den. And it's pretty shocking that at the time, most of the IOC was kind of indifferent about it. Even more shocking has been Johnson's beliefs about the whole thing, which could be summed up with the idea that it's not a big deal. Johnson said, regardless what the IOC thinks, it's definitely the best race ever run. You only cheat if no one else was not doing it. Several Olympians have had their medals stripped because of poor sportsmanship. So let's start with unified team weightlifter Ibrahim Samadov. During the 1992 competition, he had officially tied with the other Polish and Greek athletes. However, since he weighed just a tenth of a pound more than they did, he was deemed to have an advantage and was given the bronze. When it came time for them to head to the podium, Samadov threw his medal on the ground and stormed off. In spite of a later apology, Samadov was stripped of his Olympic medal. Then, in 2008, Ara Abrahamian tossed his bronze medal aside after placing third for Sweden. He made it very clear how unhappy he was, saying, I don't care about this medal. I want it gold. I consider this Olympics a failure. Abrahamian condemned his placement at third as, quote, totally unjustified. And both he and his coach claimed politics had heavily influenced the judge's decision. He announced his retirement from wrestling at the same time, but the IOC still included a ban with the removal of his medal. By the time Antonio Pettigrew was stripped of his Olympic medal, The Guardian says that his career was already over. That didn't take away the shame, though, and Pettigrew became embroiled in a massive scandal, despite the fact that he didn't have a single positive drug test on his record. Pettigrew's coach was Trevor Graham, and in 2008, Graham found himself in court over accusations regarding some very unsportsmanlike conduct. Pettigrew was one of the athletes subpoenaed to testify and admitted that he had been taking human growth hormone drugs on Graham's instructions. The time frame he gave was 1997 to 2001, and that led to the removal of all his titles during that period, including a gold medal in the 4x400 relay in 2000 Sydney Olympics. He wasn't the only one who had his medal taken away, and the admission nullified the results for the rest of his team as well. However, it's also worth noting that many of them had already been sanctioned for other doping instances, but not in 2000. Pettigrew later said, I want to play a role in teaching people, especially young athletes, to know that the negatives far, far outweigh the benefits these substances may give you. Two years later, Pettigrew's body was discovered in his car. ESPN says that his death was ruled a suicide. The phrase dress code might evoke strict high school uniform regulations, but it is something athletes must often contend with as well. Case in point, the Norwegian women's beach handball Olympic team made headlines on July 20th, 2021, when they were fined for replacing the traditional bikini bottoms of their uniforms with shorts. As reported by CNN, the European Handball Federation fined the team 1,500 euros, 150 euros per player, for improper clothing, since the team members knowingly went against the uniform regulations laid out in the International Handball Federation Beach Handball Rules of the Game. These regulations require that female athletes wear bikini bottoms with a side width that must be, quote, a maximum of 10 centimeters or 3.9 inches, with a close fit and cut on an upward angle toward the top of the leg. The male beach handball athletes, however, are required to wear shorts that fall 10 centimeters above the kneecap. Although they can be longer, 
so long as they are not too baggy. The Norwegian women's team's coach, Eskildberg Andreasen, told CNN that the regulations might discourage women from taking up the sport and that the team was willingly accepting the fine after years of fighting for the right to choose shorts over bikini bottoms. Andreasen pointed out that uniform regulations are a difficult thing for many players and that he was particularly concerned about women from majority Muslim countries choosing sports other than beach handball in order to avoid the bikini bottom uniform requirement. The Norwegian women's beach handball team received props for their stance, with the Norwegian Handball Association tweeting their support for the athletes, saying, for CNN's translation, We are very proud of these girls who, during the European Championships, raised their voices and announced that enough is enough. The team might break through and get their wish to wear shorts someday. The IHF and EHF both said they are, quote, committed to popularizing beach handball. All contributions in that respect and measures that will support the ambitions of this attractive sport are supported, according to CNN. The federations asserted that the topic of uniform requirements for females was spoken about at the April 2021 EHF Congress, and that the ongoing discussion would continue in August with the newly elected members of the Beach Handball Commission. How is that a thing? I, How did that even I, get to this point? This is so inexplicable to me. I honestly wonder, wonder if they live in the real world. Sometimes regulations veer in the other direction, though, with officials regarding female athletic attire as inappropriate because the outfit covers too little. Paralympic world champion Olivia Breen of Wales told CNN that she'd been speechless after being told at the English Championships that her sprint briefs were too short and inappropriate. Breen said that she'd gone public with the exchange to raise awareness of the unfair scrutiny, stating, You have no right to say what I can and can't wear. She also noted that the briefs were specifically designed for competition and that she had worn similar ones for years without any other complaints. Breen said to CNN that uniform regulations shouldn't make women feel self-conscious while playing sports. Breen explained, when you are competing, you want to feel as light as possible to make you perform better. She also asserted that wearing briefs rather than shorts made her feel, quote, more free. Olympic dress codes vary wildly for men and women, according to Bustle, which notes that 2016 was the first time designer Ralph Lauren, who has created the Olympic team uniforms for the United States since 2008, put both men and women in pants. In the past, the uniforms for women athletes had included skirts, while the same men's uniforms worn for the game's opening ceremonies offered pants. The article called this a step toward holding male and female athletes to the same standards by not overtly sexualizing or othering Team USA's women. Other dress code difficulties faced by female athletes include the banning of Islamic headscarves, which effectively bars some athletes from competition. In a regulation that has since been overturned, FIFA once banned uniforms with any political, religious, or personal statements, which meant Iranian women couldn't compete in the 2010 Youth Olympic Games. Women started qualifying for the Olympic Games in 1900, reported the BBC, making up 2% of the athletes. They competed in five sports, including tennis, where they played in long skirts to their ankles. Women fought to wear garb more suited for sports back then, and they continue to do so. We often wonder why any successful professional athlete would want to call it quits while still in the prime. Why would somebody prematurely call time on their playing career rather than extending it as long as possible? Here's the reasons behind the most surprising early retirements in sports history. In 1993, just months after winning his third consecutive NBA championship with the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan shocked the world by announcing his retirement at the age of 30. Even more baffling, he went on to try to play Major League Baseball instead. Aside from one big league exhibition game, he never made it out of the minors, though, and in March 1995, he returned to basketball. The result was predictable, another three-peat before he retired for a second time in 1999. In 2001, he returned a third and final time, spending his last two seasons with the Washington Wizards. But the reasons behind his first surprise retirement still remain baffling. The Indianapolis Colts seemed to be the luckiest franchise in the NFL back in the spring of 2012 as the franchise was able to move on from Peyton Manning, one of the greatest quarterbacks in league history, 
and draft Andrew Luck. By the end of the 2018 season, Luck was a four-time Pro Bowl signal caller and a 29-year-old who should have been entering his prime. Instead, Luck retired out of nowhere in August 2019, thanks to the years of injuries he sustained while playing behind lousy offensive lines. During his retirement press conference, Luck admitted that the process of constantly rehabbing physical setbacks robbed him of the love of the game. It's taken my joy of this game away. More than half a century after he last played a down of football, many fans still regard Jim Brown as the greatest player in league history. From 1957 through 1965, there was no better ball carrier than the Cleveland Browns icon who made the Pro Bowl in all nine of his seasons. Brown led the league in rushing on eight occasions. He finished atop the rushing touchdowns category five times, and he won MVP honors in 1957, 1958, and 1965. In 1964, Brown helped Cleveland win the NFL championship, a feat they are still trying in vain to replicate. Brown rushed for over 1,500 yards and 17 touchdowns in 1965 and was still at the peak of his career. On the side, though, he had begun acting and his role in the hit film The Dirty Dozen caused him to miss training camp. Brown's owner, Art Modell, threatened to fine Brown for missing camp, so Brown just retired instead at the age of 30. The Detroit Lions drafted running back Barry Sanders third overall in 1989, and it proved to be one of the best decisions they ever made. A Pro Bowl mainstay from 1989 through 1998, Sanders won four rushing titles during the 1990s, and the elusive back twice earned Offensive Player of the Year honors and took home the MVP award for the 1997 season. In 1998, Sanders rushed for over 1,400 yards for the fifth consecutive season. There was little doubt he was going to break the career rushing yards record held by Walter Payton at the time before the end of the 2000 season. Sanders never reached that milestone, though. In July 1999, just a few days after his 31st birthday, he faxed a retirement letter to his hometown newspaper. The Lions demanded that he return part of the signing bonus they had paid during his most recent contract extension. He offered instead to pay the entire bonus back if they would release him, which would have potentially allowed him to resume his career with another team. The Lions refused, and fans never saw Sanders run again. Bjorn Borg made history when he became the youngest man to win the French Open title in 1974. When he lifted that tournament's trophy a sixth time in 1981, he had won his 11th major championship, a record for the Open era at the time. Borg's rivalry with John McEnroe, spotlighted in the film Borg vs. McEnroe, remains one of the sport's greatest on-the-court feuds as they faced off 14 times from 1978 through 1981, splitting the matches with a record of seven wins apiece. By 81, however, the all-time tennis great, with a rock star look and his own groupies who attended tournaments, was burned out to the point that he admittedly didn't care all that much about losing, even to McEnroe. In 1983, at the age of 26, the cool and often quiet Borg stunningly announced his retirement. McEnroe tried to convince his rival to reconsider, and Borg eventually attempted a comeback in the early 1990s. He couldn't recapture his former glory, though, leaving fans to wonder what might have been if he had never left. There are books and documentaries dedicated to Sandy Koufax's pitching greatness. From 1961 through 1966, Sandy Koufax was arguably the most dominant pitcher the game has ever seen. Over that period, Koufax won the Cy Young Award three times. He was named World Series MVP twice, and he completed the pitching triple crown three times, leading the league in wins, strikeouts, and ERA. But at the end of 1966, at just 31 years of age, the reigning National League Cy Young Award winner stunned the baseball world when he announced his retirement. The reason was severe arthritis, so painful that it was no longer possible for Koufax to endure it any longer. I don't regret one minute of the last 12 years, but I think I would regret one year that was too many. In 1972, he became the youngest player ever elected to the Hall of Fame at just 36 years old. In July 1999, Sports Illustrated named him the magazine's favorite athlete ever, ahead of sports giants such as Muhammad Ali, Babe Ruth, Michael Jordan, and Wayne Gretzky. If it seems like a lot of early sports retirements come from NFL players, you're not the only one who has noticed. The players have taken notice, too, and perhaps no retirement turned more heads than that of San Francisco 49ers linebacker Chris Borland. Selected in the third round of the 2014 NFL Draft, Borland appeared in 14 games for the team before an ankle injury ended his season, and he dominated in those games. 
The NFL named him Defensive Player of the Month for November after he won Rookie of the Week twice that month. And following the season, the Pro Football Writers Association named Borland to its all-rookie team. But in March 2015, after just one year in the league, Borland retired from the NFL at the age of 24. Borland explained on ESPN's Outside the Lines that he believed he'd suffered three concussions during his life and that worries about the effects of head trauma resulted in his decision to permanently end his career. For me, it wasn't worth the risk. He has since turned to a life of social activism, partnering with the Union of Concerned Scientists to highlight the dangers of football and the danger of ignoring the science behind his decision. Any conversation about the greatest heavyweight boxers in history begins with Rocky Marciano. From 1947 through September 1955, the Brockton blockbuster won all 49 of his professional bouts, and 43 of those victories came via knockout. In September 1952, Marciano won the World Heavyweight Championship after he dropped then-champion Jersey Joe Walcott in the 13th round of a match Walcott was winning on the scorecards. Marciano held the heavyweight crown past his 32nd birthday, and his win over Archie Moore in September 1955 gave him 49 in a row and counting, or so everyone thought. With a potential rematch versus more looming, though, Marciano retired an unbeaten champion in April 1956. Did never really get hurt in the ring, and I feel perfect physically, and uh, probably still had two or three good fights left. Marciano remains the only undefeated heavyweight champion to exit the sport with an unblemished record. According to The Independent, Marciano rejected numerous offers to return to the ring, other than a, quote, heavily choreographed closed-door sparring session with Muhammad Ali in 1969 when Marciano was 45 years old. Tragically, Marciano died in a plane crash later that same year. Some early retirements aren't much of a surprise. Bobby Orr, for example, is widely considered the greatest hockey player of all time, but serious injuries to his knees forced him to retire for health reasons at just 30 years old. But the early retirement of the legendary Montreal Canadiens goalie Ken Dryden, on the other hand, remains shocking to this day. Dryden won his first of five Vesna Trophy Awards for Best Goalie for his performance during the 1972-73 season but he set out the entire next season due to a contract dispute. During his sabbatical, Dryden earned a law degree. He then returned to the league and helped the Canadians win four straight Stanley Cup championships. Then, after winning the Cup in five of his seven seasons with the league, he abruptly quit the league at age 31. Why? Because he simply wanted to do other things. Beyond his legal career, he became a best-selling author, president of the Toronto Maple Leafs, and even became a successful politician, getting elected to the Canadian Parliament and ascending to the position of cabinet minister. As one does, of course. Decades before Michael Phelps established himself as the most decorated Olympic swimmer in history, Mark Spitz became a household name for his performances at the 1972 Summer Games, where he won seven gold medals. And he might have set a career record even Phelps couldn't have beaten except for one thing. Spitz retired from the Olympics at the age of 22 to cash in on his fame through endorsement deals and other business opportunities. That's because the rules of the time required all Olympic athletes to be strictly amateur. Spitz revealed in 2011 that he had to quit swimming as a result. I retired because I didn't have a future in swimming because we couldn't make money. The rules were different back then than they are today. According to the International Swimming Hall of Fame, Spitz held 33 official and recognized world records upon his retirement. ESPN ultimately named him 33rd on their list of the 50 greatest North American athletes of the century. If you're into sports, there's nothing like the thrill of watching a game. The adrenaline pounding, the pride in your heart after a win. You can never understand it unless you felt it. But sometimes, the love of the game can go too far as it did with these heated sports rivalries. Auburn and Alabama first met on the football field in 1893 and continued to duke it out annually in the Iron Bowl. Like a lot of local rivals, they've had their scuffles over the years, but nothing was as bad as one prank that went way too far. To understand the story, you have to understand the significance of Toomer's Corner, an intersection in downtown Auburn that is named for Toomer's Drugstore. It's most notable for the giant oak trees that used to stand across the street. After Auburn wins, students would descend on Toomer's Corner and cover the trees with toilet paper. That was probably annoying for whoever had to clean it up, but it was basically innocent fun. Then, in 2010, it all came to a sudden end. A 
guy who called himself Al from Dadeville phoned in to a local radio show to say that after Auburn beat Alabama that year, he had driven 30 miles and dumped a very strong herbicide on the two trees. It wasn't a joke. The soil around the trees was tested and nothing could be done. The trees were going to die. Al, who turned out to be a man named Harvey Updike Jr., was eventually found and sentenced to six months in jail. The trees were removed in 2011 and finally replaced in 2015. Even though we have differences, we can all come together you know, as a state. The Indiana Pacers are one of the Detroit Pistons' most intense rivals in the NBA, and it all came to a head on November 19, 2004. An incident that would become known as the Malice at the Palace was one of the most shameful moments in sports history as a rivalry spilled off the court. It all started with hard fouls. As play got more aggressive, the referees failed to keep the game under control. It was a setup for disaster. With less than a minute left on the game clock, Pacers forward Ron Artest aggressively fouled Pistons center Ben Wallace, who responded by shoving Artest across the floor. The teams came together to keep Artest and Wallace away from each other, but then the Pacers Steven Jackson went over and started taunting the Pistons coach. Derek Coleman stood up from the bench in response and threatened to kill him. Amazingly though, things seemed to start calming down, but then suddenly someone in the stands threw a drink that hit Artest, who jumped over the scorer's table and started attacking the fan. Other players got involved, fans kept throwing things, and some of them even ended up on the court. The announcers called it what it was, a disgrace. Everything changed after that, with the NBA overhauling protocols involving security and the amount of alcohol sold at games. The players involved were suspended for a total of 146 games. Years later, Artest, now known as Meta World Peace, revealed that he had befriended the fan who threw the drink at him. But you're friends with the guy who, who hit you with the beer? Uh, absolutely. This is, the reason why. this is the reason why I reached out to him, because I, I, I don't like to hold grudges. While a lot of sports have a reputation for being a bit thuggish, that's usually not the case with figure skating. But in 1994, the world learned that where there is competition, people will get violent, no matter what their sport. That was the year that Nancy Kerrigan got whacked in the knee by someone connected to her rival Tanya Harding right before the Winter Olympics. In 1991, Harding won the U.S. Figure Skating Championships, becoming the first American woman to land a triple axel in competition. She was rewarded with a perfect score. Meanwhile, Kerrigan went home with the bronze. But off the ice, Kerrigan was the clear winner. She was prettier and richer, and those things count in figure skating. As the Olympics got closer, the rivalry became too much, at least for Harding's ex-husband, Jeff Galuli, who hired someone to kneecap Kerrigan. Harding still claims that she knew nothing about it. Regardless, at the time, she seemed thrilled about her Olympic chances, saying in an interview, quote, I'm gonna whip her butt. Instead, she finished in eighth and watched her rival go home with the silver. Hockey is full of rivalries, and it's fair to say that fights can start over someone just looking at somebody else the wrong way. The St. Louis Blues and Chicago Blackhawks have a particular hatred for each other, and on March 17, 1991, it got bad. The fights were so intense that the game was pretty much secondary. Fisticuffs started in the second period after a hard hit was responded to with a shove and it went downhill from there. As fights broke out all over the ice, players on the benches also joined the fray. In the end, even the players thought it went too far. Adam Oates of the Blues said, It was weird. I was pretty scared, I'll tell you that. Let me rephrase that. Terrified. If a fight is big enough to shake one of the hard men of ice hockey, then it was probably pretty bad. By the end of the game, a record 278 penalty minutes had been given out. 12 players were ejected, both teams were fined $10,000. The incident would come to be remembered as the St. Patrick's Day Massacre. The Cold War elicited a lot of hard feelings in sports, including a 1987 hockey game in Czechoslovakia between Canada and the Soviet Union that broke out into a 20-minute free-for-all. The two teams were competing for the World Junior Hockey Championship, and all the players were under 20 years old. We can't say for sure if complex international relations started this particular brawl, but it makes as much sense as any other explanation. It started normally enough, as far as hockey goes. Two kids took off their helmets and started punching each other in the face while the refs tried to break it up. Then another fight broke out, with one player holding another down on the ice and slugging him. Another fight broke out, and suddenly everyone was on the ice and throwing punches. Helmets and sticks were all over the place. 
so it was a pretty weird way to spend 20 minutes. Both teams were disqualified, and other countries walked away with the medals. The fight was so bad that it would become known as the Punch-Up in Piastani. We don't know who started this fight, but it is a black mark against international hockey. This, this was an ugly fight. It's not just big-name sports teams that have harsh rivalries. The biggest fight in college football's Division II is the one between Washita Baptist and Henderson State, both of which are located in Arkadelphia, Arkansas. They've gone at it every year since 1895 in the Battle of the Ravine. Like most college rivalries, this one features pranks, like crop dusting with marshmallows. But then there's the prank that went a little bit too far. In 1946, a woman named Ann Strickland was attending Washita and had just been named the homecoming queen. One day, a car of people she knew from her childhood pulled up next to her and encouraged her to get in. The key piece of information was that all of them now attended Henderson. They took Strickland to a lake house 30 miles away and kept her there for days without allowing her to leave. Meanwhile, Washita personnel were looking for her, including Bill Vining, her boyfriend and the team's defensive back. He hid a shotgun under his clothes and then showed up at a hotel where it was rumored she was being held. Fortunately, no one was shot. Strickland was eventually released, and the game went on as usual. Even in the heady world of soccer rivalries, West Ham and Millwall's hatred for each other is notorious. The animosity between these two London clubs stretches back to 1926, when two different groups of dock workers supported the respective teams. Over the years, they've had infamous battles, but while hooliganism has mostly died out in respectable soccer circles, West Ham and Millwall still managed to get up to an epic fight in 2009. The teams met at West Ham's Upton Park for a second-round game of the Carling Cup, and things went wrong within minutes. Hundreds of fans got involved, repeatedly invading the pitch to the point where the game had to be delayed. Outside the ground, it was even worse. People started throwing garbage, bottles, and bricks that came out of nowhere. Some emerged with bloody faces, and one guy was stabbed. Only two people were arrested, probably partly because 200 cops in riot gear plus 20 on horses were there to escort fans out of the stadium to the subway to keep things from getting worse. Also, not that it mattered, West Ham won the game 3-1. The rivalry between the San Francisco Giants and the Los Angeles Dodgers is one of the most legendary in Major League Baseball history, and on August 22, 1965, it took a violent turn. Giants pitcher Juan Marichal threw some balls a little too close to the Dodgers' batters for their liking. When it was Marichal's turn to bat, catcher John Roseborough told Dodgers pitcher Sandy Koufax to do the same thing to him. Koufax chose not to hit Marichal, so Roseborough thought he would do it himself. As he threw the ball back to the mound, he brushed by Marichal's head, possibly even clipping his ear. Marichal wasn't having it, but he didn't use his fist like in normal baseball fights. Instead, he turned and hit Roseboro twice with his bat, cutting the catcher's head. Roseboro walked away bloodied and shaken and had to be watched for signs of a concussion the rest of the night. Then a 15-minute brawl broke out that cleared both benches. When asked the next day what punishment Marichal should get, Roseboro asked for 10 minutes in a room with him. Fortunately, there were no lasting hard feelings. Marichal was even an honorary pallbearer at Roseboro's funeral in 2002. After what happened, I, I told the whole world how sad I was. I regret what I did. In the early decades of the 20th century, tensions were simmering between the neighboring countries of El Salvador and Honduras due to political issues like immigration. In 1969, it all came to a boil, thanks in part to a series of soccer games. The matches were part of qualifying for the 1970 World Cup. For much of the world, soccer is a religion, and these games are a big deal. The first match was on June 8th in Honduras, which featured fighting between the fans. So when Honduras went to El Salvador for the next game on June 27th, things got out of hand. People stood on the side of the road and shot into the Honduran's team bus. Then they gathered outside the hotel where the team was staying and screamed all night so that no one could sleep. Then a riot broke out at the game itself. In retaliation for their team's treatment, people in Honduras dragged El Salvadoran immigrants from their homes and beat them. The situation wasn't helped by the media coverage or open displays of extreme national pride around the matches. Within a few short weeks, the countries were at war. While it only lasted four days, over 4,000 people died, including civilians. If there is soccer, there is a rivalry. 
In Egypt, things are especially heated between the clubs El Masri and El Ali. On February 1, 2012, in an incident known as the Port Said Massacre, one match turned from sports rivalry to epic tragedy. The major issue started at halftime. Fans of El Masri lit things on fire and started throwing them on the pitch, and some fans invaded the pitch as well. They were cleared off before the second half started, but things got worse when play resumed. El Masri fans started attacking El Ali's bench and kept throwing flames around. They invaded the pitch again, and then security made a big mistake when clearing them off as they let the El Masri fans go to the El Ali area. This may have been by design. El Ali fans had recently been involved in some anti-police demonstrations, and the cops guarding the game may have hoped they'd be put in their place a little, but they couldn't have wanted what happened next. Some Al Masri fans had smuggled knives into the stadium, and as the game ended, they started using them on El Ali's fans. Some people tried to protect their team's players. Some victims died in a stampede as everyone fled the violence. In the end, 74 people were killed. Live TV can amp up already crazy sports moments. Pro athletes stretch the limits of what seems humanly possible, and adding other humans into the mix is like throwing sporty fuel on a dramatic fire. Here are some unreal sports moments that were broadcast on live TV. The 1994 NBA Finals have often been called the Forgotten Finals. In case you're one of the many who forgot what happened, the Houston Rockets, led by Hakeem Olajuwon, squared off against Patrick Ewing and his New York Knicks. On paper, it was an awesome matchup between two of basketball's most towering figures. In reality, it wasn't particularly exciting, until something happened off the court that fans will never forget. Police had recently charged retired NFL player O.J. Simpson with the killings of his ex-wife Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ron Goldman. He was supposed to turn himself in, but instead he jumped into his now infamous white Bronco and fled at an almost leisurely pace along the freeway. Watching an NFL Hall of Famer lazily evade capture was apparently more exciting than whatever the Rockets and Knicks were doing, so NBC relegated the game to a small box in the corner of the screen. Mike Tyson was the type of boxer who wanted to eat his opponents alive, and in 1997, he almost succeeded. It all went down during the hotly anticipated sequel to his 1996 showdown with Evander Holyfield, which Holyfield won in the 11th round. Almost 1.9 million people tuned into Showtime to watch the baddest man on the planet try to even the score with the real deal. What followed was 1,000 straitjackets worth of crazy. In round two, Tyson sustained a gash over his right eye after receiving what he considered intentional headbutts from Holyfield. Then in round three, referee Mills Lane gave Holyfield an earful for landing a low blow. So Tyson, already incensed about the headbutting, soon gave Holyfield an earful of teeth. Holyfield hopped with pained disbelief after having a chunk of his right ear dentally removed. Shockingly, the fight was allowed to continue, and Tyson then bit Holyfield's left ear, triggering a much-deserved disqualification. Tyson was hit with a $3 million fine and an 18-month boxing ban. Years later, he appeared opposite Holyfield in a Foot Locker commercial that featured him apologetically returning the ear. My ear. I kept that in formaldehyde. NBA legend Shaquille O'Neal was a special kind of huge. The 7'1 center resembled an oversized redwood tree on the court. Even the by no means small Charles Barkley once said, I played in the NBA for 16 years. Shaquille O'Neal is the only guy that I ever said, wow, that's a big dude. And how could Barkley not feel that way? The first time they played against each other, Shaq attacked a basket so hard that it died. The massacre happened in 1993 when Shaq was an NBA rookie with something to prove. During a nationally televised matchup between his Orlando Magic and Barkley's Phoenix Suns, Shaq made a thunderous dunk that caused the entire basket to collapse. Incredulous viewers accused the NBA and NBC of rigging the basket to fall. In reality, Shaq was just freakishly beefy. In fact, later that year, he ripped a backboard off the basket. In response, the NBA had to create Shaq-proof backboards. The NBA has seen more than its fair share of off-the-wall characters. Among those oddballers was Ron Artest, who now goes by Meta World Peace. A cursory glance at his basketball pass will make you think his new name is a meta joke. Back when he was an Indiana Pacer, the Artest formerly known as Ron was about as peaceful as the Thunderdome. The most striking example of this was the incident known as the Malice at the Palace. On November 19, 2004, the Palace of Auburn Hills became the site of a royal rumble between the home team Detroit Pistons and the visiting Pacers. With 45 seconds left in the game, the Pacers had a commanding 15-point lead, but Pistons center Ben Wallace refused to go down without a fight. After getting fouled by Artest, 
Wallace retaliated with a ferocious shove. Officials and players quickly stepped in to prevent a fist fight, but Pistons fan John Green reignited the spark by chucking his beer at Artest. An enraged Artest lunged into the crowd and two of his teammates followed him into the fray. Foolhardy fans engaged the Pacers in battle as other spectators hurled trash through the air. The entire debacle aired on a nationwide ESPN broadcast, which was a huge black eye for the NBA. In response, the league suspended nine players for a total of 146 games, including 86 for our test. When you truly love someone, you'll move heaven and earth to show them how much you care. The same thing happens when you love a sports team, except it's creepier since most fans don't know the players personally. Nevertheless, a dramatic fan gesture can be insanely sweet, or at least insane. One fan named Mike Sergio loved the New York Mets so much that he didn't just move heaven and earth. He moved from earth to heaven and back down again to show his support. Sergio was no ordinary fan. He was a rock musician, construction worker, soap opera actor, and amateur skydiver. He knew how to make a dramatic entrance, and during the 1986 World Series, he did just that. The Mets had just lost Game 5 to the Boston Red Sox, and Sergio decided to cheer his team on in the most scene-stealing way imaginable during Game 6. With the aid of an accomplice, he parachuted into Shea Stadium with a banner reading, Go Mets. Spectators and players alike went wild, and it all ended with Sergio going to jail.